dimensions. But what I can show you is the shadow in three dimensions of a four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract. This is it. And you can see it's two nested cubes, all the vertices connected by lines. And now the real tesseract in four dimensions would have all the lines of equal length and all the angles right angles. That's not what we see here, but that's the penalty of projection. So you see, while we cannot imagine the world of four dimensions, we can certainly think about it perfectly well. Now, imagine a universe just like Flatland, truly two-dimensional, and entirely flat in every direction, but with one exception. Unbeknownst to the inhabitants, their two-dimensional universe is curved into a third physical dimension, maybe into a sphere, but at any rate, into something entirely outside their experience. Locally, their universe still looks flat enough, but if one of them, much smaller and flatter than me, takes a very long walk along what seems to be a straight line, he would uncover a great mystery. Suppose he marked his starting point here and set off to explore his universe. He never turns around and he never reaches an edge. He doesn't know that his apparently flat universe is actually curved into an enormous sphere. He doesn't sense that he's walking around a globe. Why should his space be curved? Because there's so much matter in this universe that it gravitationally warps space, closing it back on itself into a sphere. But our flatlander doesn't know this. After a long while, you'll find he somehow returns to his starting point. There must be a third dimension. Our flatlander couldn't imagine a third dimension, but he could sure deduce it. Now, increase all the dimensions in this story by one, and you have something like the situation which many cosmologists think may actually apply to us. We are three-dimensional creatures trapped in three dimensions. We imagine our universe to be flat in three dimensions, but maybe it's curved into a fourth. We can talk about a fourth physical dimension, but we can't experience it. No one can point to the fourth dimension. I mean, there's left, right, and there's forward, back, there's up, down, and uh, there's uh, some other direction simultaneously at right angles to those familiar three dimensions. Now, imagine this universe is expanding. If we blow it up like a four-dimensional balloon, what happens? An astronomer in a given galaxy thinks all the other galaxies are running away from him. The more distant the galaxy, the faster it seems to be moving. This is just what Hummison and Hubble found. On the surface of this curved universe, there is no boundary or center. The universe can be both finite and unbounded. The red shift of the distant galaxies seemed to imply to Hummison's contemporaries that we were at the center of an expanding universe, that our place in space was somehow privileged. But if the universe is expanding, whether or not it's curved into a fourth dimension, observers on every galaxy will see precisely the same thing. All the galaxies rushing away from them as if they had made some dreadful intergalactic social blunder. If there's enough matter to close the universe gravitationally, then it's wrapped in on itself like a sphere. If there isn't enough matter to close the cosmos, then our universe has an open shape extending forever in all directions. This saddle universe is only one of an infinite number of possible kinds of open universes. Unlike such closed universes as the sphere, open universes have in them an infinite amount of space. If our universe is in fact closed off, then nothing can get out, not matter, not light. We would then be living inside a black hole. There is one possible way out though, a hypothetical tunnel or wormhole through the next higher dimension, a place sucking in matter and light. 
Can we find such a wormhole? Could we survive the trip? We might emerge in some other place in time, perhaps in another universe, or perhaps somewhere else in our own. If you want to know what it's like inside a black hole, look around. But we don't yet know whether the universe is open or closed. More than that, there are a few astronomers who doubt that the redshift of distant galaxies is due to the Doppler effect, who are skeptical about the expanding universe and the Big Bang. Perhaps our descendants will regard our present ignorance with as much sympathy as we feel to the ancients for not knowing whether the Earth went around the sun. If the general picture, however, of a Big Bang followed by an expanding universe is correct, what happened before that? Was the universe devoid of all matter and then the matter suddenly, somehow created? How did that happen? In many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or if we say that God always existed, why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here? These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. Who knows for certain? Who shall here declare it? Whence was it born? Whence came creation? The gods are later than this world's formation. Who then can know the origins of the world? None knows whence creation arose, or whether he has or has not made it, he who surveys it from the lofty skies. Only he knows, or perhaps he knows not. These words, are 3,500 years old. They're taken from the Rig Veda, a collection of early Sanskrit hymns. The most sophisticated ancient cosmological ideas came from Asia and particularly from India. Here, there's a tradition of skeptical questioning and unselfconscious humility before the great cosmic mysteries. Amidst the routine of daily life, in say the harvesting and winnowing of grain, people all over the world have wondered, where did the universe come from? Asking this question is a hallmark of our species. There's a natural tendency to understand the origin of the cosmos in familiar biological terms, the mating of cosmic deities or the hatching of a cosmic egg, or maybe the intonation of some magic phrase. The Big Bang is our modern scientific creation myth. It comes from the same human need to solve the cosmological riddle. Most cultures imagine the world to be only a few hundred human generations old. Hardly anyone guessed that the cosmos might be far older, but the ancient Hindus did. They, like every other society, noted and calibrated the cycles in nature. The rising and setting of the sun and stars, the phases of the moon, the passing of the seasons. 